Today you're gonna hear the story of a fighter's journey. Uh, you're gonna hear about the, the decisions and choices and events that led to him being on the path that he's on now. You're gonna hear about his goals. You're gonna hear about his struggles. Uh, you're gonna hear about, you're gonna hear a discussion about what it's like to be defeated not just in a ring, but in life in general. You're gonna hear about how to overcome betrayal and hurt and uh, dismay and the, the struggle that comes with, with redefining yourself and finding a new path and accepting it and growing in it and enjoying it. Uh, today we're talking with Juan Torres. Uh, hope you enjoy. Speed for heavyweight. Vicious right hook, but misses. And Torres carries with a right hook. And Torres here. Uh, hey. He's uh, he's fresh out of the gym, uh, re ready to rock and roll. He's he's got a pretty impressive uh, background and history and story to tell. And I'm just gonna allow him to introduce himself. Um. Shoot, I always that's that's one of the questions or or one of the the parts of interviews that I hate the most introducing myself. Uh, I'm Juan Torres, man. I uh out of Cypress, Texas, out of Houston, Texas. Uh, moved out to Huntsville, been to college in Oklahoma, Louisiana, everywhere you can think of, man. I've been all around the the uh outside states of Texas, man. I've been I've been there and done that. So okay. Um, so what, so you, you, I know you played college football, right? Yes, sir. Did, did you play football in high school too? Safe to I assume? played football from the fifth grade all the way through college, man. That That's, that's, uh, I can honestly say that taught me a lot about life in itself, man. Just putting in the hard work and dedication to try to be someone in football. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, safe to say you weren't like a wide receiver. No, no, you know. When when I started in seventh grade, when we started in junior high, I'd always wanted to be a running back, man. I remember my friend who actually just passed away, Katie Patter or Casey Patterson. He uh, we used to play football outside in the street, and and he used to have some sick juke moves, man. And I remember trying to learn from him how to juke at two. I was in seventh grade, and I was two hundred and forty pounds trying to juke like him. My yeah, my dream was always, you know. I wanted to be a running back. That was it. I wanted to be a running back, and I thought I thought I could throw the football pretty well playing street ball. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be a quarterback as well. But my coaches quickly shut that out, shut right. that down. Yeah. Go go get you on a defensive line somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was a defensive lineman, and uh, you know, seventh through tenth grade, I played defensive line, offensive line, and uh, you know, in, while doing that, I learned that you know they taught me how to deep snap, and you know. Well, that's pretty. I mean, that that's that's pretty interesting. I know several people that have played college ball, and they all really enjoyed the experience. Uh, I think in in college, I feel like they they really develop a sense of unity amongst each other. It's a kind of a turn into a family of sorts, more so than in in high school, uh, and sure. definitely more so than uh, when they get to the pros. You know, so that's that's. It's, right. uh, it's kind of an interesting dynamic. And what, what, what size school were you at? Okay, so when I when I went to when I started off my freshman year, I played at Blinn Junior College. Okay. I started off at Blinn Junior College because I was, you know, I didn't make the best grades in high school, so I had to go through junior college first. So you're when basically did... Cam Newton. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, so, yeah there you go. Basically. Yeah. 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 Basically, that's right. So. <laughs> So I went and did that. After my first year at Blinn, I transferred over to uh, southeastern Oklahoma. Okay. Spent, I think, two years there. I did the, the red shirt program over there. And then uh, they brought in a really good defensive tackle. I think he was from Oklahoma. You know, it's a Division two school. They brought him in, gave him all the scholarship money. And I was like, well, I'm not going to get to play here. I might as well transfer Transferred down to Louisiana, out in uh, Pineville, Louisiana. Louisiana College is the name of the school. It's a really small Division three school. Okay. So I ended up, I ended up finishing my career there, and I ended up graduating from there, of course. And nice. You know, 
What, 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 was your, uh, what, what were you studying? What was your degree in? So <laughs> I wanted to be a coach. I, I wanted to be a coach. And uh, I think right around my junior year, junior and senior year, I had this really, really cool criminal justice instructor. And uh, I had, I, I wanted to change my major. But when I went and told my counselor that, she was like, you're going to be here another three years if you do that. So uh, I ended up just getting my minor in criminal justice. And, uh, you know, I just remember just graduating and, and wanting to be a parole officer, wanted to be a cop. You know, I wanted to do something like that, wanted to help people. Helping people has always been, I think, you know, big with me. I've always wanted to help people. So, so that's, what, that's really what was uh, driving you towards that, that field, the law enforcement, the idea of helping people, helping the community, making a positive difference. That's right. That's it. What, what, what do you think gave you that itch? Was that something that you felt early, like, uh, you know, in, in high school or before high school? or was... Well, my dad was a cop and his dad was a cop down there in Mexico. So, you know, I guess it runs in the family kind of, you know. Um, and just, just, you know, seeing good cops that actually went out there and helped and, you know, did little things for people. I definitely, you know, like I said, I've always, I've always wanted to be, I'm humble. I can say I'm humble. I've, I've always wanted to help people out. And, you know, I ended up working for the state for a little while. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it happens to the best of us. It happens to the best of us. <laughs> That's right. All right. So, uh, so you had the, the itch to help people. How did that turn into the itch to knock people out? I'm a knucklehead, man. I, I grew up, I grew up rough. I grew up rough, man. I grew up, you know, in a neighborhood where if you don't, you know, you don't defend yourself, you get ate up, you get ate up, man. They'll, they'll, they'll make you, they'll make you that neighborhood, that person in the neighborhood that you get beat up on every time. So you either, either get with it or, or, or don't or stay in the house. But when, when, when can you remember like the first time you felt like that, that, fight or fight feeling and knew that really fight was your only option? I think there's a couple times. There was one time, I'll never forget this. I will never forget this. I, I was always the youngest one out there playing basketball and football with the kids, with the older kids, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I remember this kid and I was so scared of him. And I don't, now I look back and I, I don't understand why. I guess because he was older and, you know, he was, 13, 14, I was in like fifth grade and he had tattoos already. It just got out in and out of juvenile hall. And I was like, man, that's that's a dude you don't mess with, right? And I'll never forget, I will never forget this. His name was Michael. He uh we were playing basketball and and you know, I was pretty athletic, so I I did something, made a good move, crossed him or something, and went and laid it up. I turned around and he popped me right in the mouth. Popped mm -hmm. me right in the mouth for no reason. And, and I, like I said, I was fourth or fifth grade. And I remember going home and crying, going home and crying. And I'm a mama's boy too. My mama, she, she, that's my angel right there. So I go home crying. My dad was still at work. And she, she walks out of the house straight, walks straight out of the house, goes over to him and smacks him in the back of the head. Back. And I'm like, oh shit. Oh no. You know, I'm like, man, now, I'm, I'm never going to, I'm never going to live this down. Now everybody's going to. You know, I'm the mama's boy whose mama went out there and smacked the kid in the back of the head. Yeah. And I, I remember him not saying anything, not, you know, he just walked home. He just went home. Uh, about a week later, a week later is when the same thing. And, you know, I was embarrassed. Nobody really said nothing about, you know, my mom walking out there and smacking him in the back of the head. But I remember, like, I can't let this shit happen again. And uh, mm. we're playing basketball. And same thing, you know, boom, beat him to the goal and, and score. Uh, I turn around, and he throws the ball right at my face. Wow. I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. I just start swinging. I just start swinging, man. And, and it turned out good for me. I held him down. And, <laughs> you know, I, I, was, I was in fourth or fifth grade, and I remember just holding him down and punching him and crying at the same time. Mm -hmm. We get up. We get split up. And. You know, he goes home, and I sit there and try to catch my breath. Man, that was my first fight ever, or my second fight ever. My first fight was when a kid in fourth grade, we were on the swings in the playground, 
And the one thing you don't do is say a your mama joke to me because I was really sensitive back then. Because you're a mama's boy. I'm a mama's boy. And he said something about my mama. And I popped him in the nose. And I remember, I remember we it was they called recess. We go and sit down and he's bleeding and crying. And and I just walk and I'm like, I walk up to the child. I'm I, I hit him in the nose. I need to go to the office, don't I? And she's like, yeah. <laughs> so we go to the office and you know, they clean him up and, and his mom comes and you know, they they complain about me and that was that. That was the very first one. So did you turn into friends with any of the kids that you uh you had fought with? It's been my experience that usually after after a good scrap and you really get the feel for each other, uh there's there's some level of respect that's gained through this. Yep. And now all of a sudden I really hated you yesterday, but now that you made me bleed a little bit and I made you bleed a little bit. Now for some reason we're we've gone. Yeah, now, now <laughs> yeah. we're BFFs and whatnot. That's yeah. right. I I I'll tell you what, man, after that fight, I uh the, the fight with the basketball stuff, all the older boys respected me. It was one of those things where they left me alone. They knew they thought I was crazy because I just like I said, I went off and I started crying and I just started pounding him and I mean you know, we're just gonna play basketball and football with this dude and and leave him be, cause this dude, this dude can go from zero to a hundred in a quick second. So, and that's a, boy, know. those tears are dangerous, aren't they? Oh yeah, oh Man. yeah, they, they, that's yeah. It, it, boy, that that's 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 that real stuff. That's that that yeah. that's that real anger when you when you got the when you're there's climbing, so much man. just happening inside of you, you don't know where to yeah. go. It pops out in tears. Yeah. That, that's that real that's stuff. That's right. Yeah, that's right, man. Yeah. Uh, so you 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 played ball through college. You had your eye on law enforcement. Um, you you realized along the way that you got a pretty solid fight game. Uh, you 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 enjoy it. You probably had some success with it. You uh, oh, yeah. you you learned to gain people's respect a little bit through it. Um, but at the same time, you, you're you're like a nice dude. You're, yeah. you know, when when if you just left that part out, you would sound like just some old uh, knucklehead bully type. But right. you're far you're far away from that. You're like this nice right. guy who just might happen to knock you out if you get a little funny. You know. That's right. So, That's right. Uh, after after the football, get out of uh, uh, college. How soon after that? Did you sniff out uh, a, a a gym, and and was your first was your first taste of organized combat sports? Was that MMA? Was that boxing? Was it uh, some jujitsu? Or you know, what, what, where'd you find your rhythm at in there? So I get I graduate college, and we move back to Houston. End up moving back to my parents' house for I think a month. Um, after that, you know, I started I started working for the state. I started working for TC, so I moved to Conroe, and in Conroe, there was, I looked looked around there, and there was two gyms, I think. There was a Iron Mantis, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and then some, some gym with some guy named Rocky Long, who didn't even have a gym. He trained people out of his garage, but I did more research on him, and, you know, he's a Texas legend, and that, that's his nickname, and and, you know, you, you look into him, and he's got over 20-something fights. At the time, he had, I think, over 20 or 30 fights. He actually had over 30 professional bouts. And, you know, I called the jiu-jitsu gym first because I didn't really want to train out of a gym or out of a out of a garage. Right. Yeah, right. It didn't feel so, legit, right? It, yeah, right. So um, I called the jiu-jitsu gym, and, and the guy, Sean Key, he answers the phone. You know, and I'm like, hey, man, you know, I just I just moved in from Louisiana. I just started training MMA about six months ago, and I'm I'm looking to continue doing this. He's like, well, we're, we're a jiu-jitsu gym, but come on, man. If, if, if you know, if if you want to train MMA, we can get you some stand-up, and we'll work with you. We'll, we'll figure it out. So first few weeks I get there, and we're doing, we're doing jiu-jitsu. We're doing, uh, you know, MMA. He didn't really have a – much of a MMA, you know, uh, class or whatever. So it was, it was mostly jujitsu, which to this day, I love jujitsu, man. I, 
I want, you know, I want to continue that. I want to continue my jujitsu journey. And, and he ended up being one of my best friends in, in, in this world, man. One of these dudes where when I was going through rough times, I'd call him and I'd be like, man, this is how I'm feeling. And, you know, he wasn't, he, he was more than a coach to me. He was, he became a best friend. He became family to me. And that's, to me, that's everything. Cause there ain't too many people out there that, you know, I consider family or friends or that I say that I love, you know, and, uh, I, I kind of ventured over to Rocky. I ended up calling Rocky because I kept watching his videos and kept hearing about him. So yeah, man, come over. This is the address, and we'll be training out of the garage. I get there, and everything just seems kind of funny. So I'm like, all right, I'll give this a try. Uh, you know, I go, I get to sparring, and and I remember it was me, Rocky, and Josh Pitts, man. Two, like I said, two two other people that man, I will cut. I'll cut for those dudes, man. Those, those dudes. You know, to this day, I you know I try to keep in touch with them. Whether it's just saying, "Hey, hey, what's up? I miss you. Hope you hope everything's good. Whatever, you know." And uh, Rocky was like, after like a week or two weeks, he was like, "Man, you got so much power. We're not we're not even gonna do amateurs. We're just gonna turn you pro." And I'm like, "Well, shit. I, you know, I don't mind making money. And if you think I can make it to the UFC, let's do it." You know. Like three months after that, man, I'm I'm in the cage fighting a dude that was like three and one. I ended up, you know, out grappling him and and uh, beating him. We it was a decision win, and you know everybody was wide eyed. Everybody was like, "Wow, man, this dude, this dude got something." And I was and I cut weight. I was still, you know, running around at 290 pounds, cutting down to 265. So I was very raw, and and you know he's he's one of the people that believed in me, and and we went through it, and you know. That's how I started. Okay. And uh, so you, you hung out in MMA for a while. I've, uh, I know you fought in Bellator, right? So yeah. yeah. Uh, Bellator fights. I, I've, I've been to a couple of your fights. Uh, yeah. Always a good show. You're always uh, always, always <laughs> an entertaining uh, uh, character while you're in there. Yes, um, it, it always looks like you're just uh, you're you're looking for your opportunity to to turn their head sideways, you know, like right. that, that's right. your that's your thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're gonna do all this other stuff because we got to do this other stuff. But if I if I find my spot, it's I'm game okay. over. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, you know, I think I think it was like my fourth fight, man. Every fight that I had was against you know guys that are like top notch, like. You were, that that can fight in the UFC that can, or just got from the UFC or that can fight in Bellator or just left Bellator. The 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 guy that I fought in Bellator, he, Chris, what was his name? Chris Rand or something like that. He he had, he was on the Ultimate Fighter and you know this that and the other. So it, it's one of the, and then fighting it, fighting man. It's just to me it's just it's it's fun in there man. Like you're not gonna get stabbed. You're not gonna get shot. You're not gonna get hit, hit in the back of the head with a bat. Mm. It's just combat man it's funny there's a ref not... there to make sure things don't get out of exactly hand. exactly yeah. if, if i get hurt the ref's probably gonna stop it or if he gets hurt the ref will stop it mm -hmm. it's not the streets man it's not the streets right so uh at what what drove you to focus on boxing opposed to mma it sounds like you were having a really good time in mma but what what was the what was the thought process in focusing on boxing you went to bare knuckle for a minute, right? Uh, do you still? Yeah, I'm still. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm still under contract with the BKFC. I got two more fights with them, and I try to make it to where boxing's priority. But if the BKFC comes, some comes up, and I'm available, man, I'm gonna jump on it. You know, I'm just I love like that, that shit, man. That, is that you? You find that to be more exciting, or or just uh, a new and raw and kind of. Uh, feel like you're helping lay the foundation or like what, what, what about the bare knuckle is the draw for you? Like, I, like you, you mentioned it and your whole face kind of lights up. Yeah. It's just, it's just all of that, all of that, all of that you just said, man, like it's real. It's so real. It's, it, it reminds <laughs> me of back in the day. It reminds me of high school. It reminds me of junior high. It reminds me of, you know, just, you know, it just, it's real. It's mm -hmm. real, dude. Like that's the realest thing to it's just real i can't right. even explain it okay <laughs> uh, how, how right. many fights have you had within bare knuckle i've had two i've had i'm, I'm one in one I, I had one in wyoming where i knocked the guy out in the second round and then i had one in 
Mississippi where we, we went all five rounds and, you know, he broke his hand on my head and he popped me in the eye and my eye was swelled up and his his orbital or something was fractured. I mean, it was, it was a good fight. I just, <laughs> yeah, I just, I just didn't come out with the win, man. Okay. Well, now the, the bare knuckle, from what I've seen of it, you, you still have on gloves, right? But the, the knuckles are exposed, or is it just no gloves at all? No gloves, no gloves. The only it looks like you have gloves on because you got that the tape around your wrist, and, and okay. it's op it's optional. There's guys that like uh, Tony Lopez. You know, he's he's well known. He he literally just gets a strip of tape because it, it tells the, the the judges and everybody else what corner he's in, and he'll put that around his wrist. Me, I tape my wrist up. I I tape my the the my hands up to like two inches from my knuckles, but. Everything is just, it's raw. It's, I mean, it's the real deal. And now that does, you can inflict more damage as far as like cuts and, and stuff like that, right? But, right. Um, I've always understood it to where a boxing glove doesn't necessarily protect your hand or, or the, the, the face of the opponent, right? Like you get hit right. with a boxing glove and, and it's still, a massive uh, blow and, and can inflict a lot of trauma, right? But right, right. the glove is more to protect your hand, right? Exactly. That's All right. right. So, That's so right. we remove the glove and it increases the probability of cuts and shiners and things like that, the, the superficial wounds on the face, right? The, the right. flesh wounds, if you will. Um, sure. But it also definitely increases the probability that you're going to like break your hand yes yeah 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 if you like for the most part most guys are going to throw with full power you right know, they say yeah. they say that you know because you're bare knuckle you're gonna you're gonna throw your punches lighter you're gonna throw them to the body but these dudes are in that ring for a reason man they're crazy mm -hmm. everybody that goes in there is crazy man you got you got you got to be real messed up in the head to be like yeah i'll do that you know and, and like the dude that I fought, man, I guess I just have good hand bones or something because, you know, I throw hard and I, I've been blessed enough to where I haven't broken the hand. But the dude that I fought in the BKFC, he, uh, he broke his hand in like the last round. And the only thing he could do was slap, mm -hmm. get points. And I remember getting slapped by him and going, did this motherfucker just slap me? Like, he just slapped me. <laughs> and, and I thought in my mind, it was like, man, he disrespected me. But talking to him afterwards we had a beer afterwards and he just couldn't close his hand he mm. couldn't do anything but slip i broke to my yeah yeah man i, bro I broke my hand there at uh east ham one time oh yeah, yeah so. <laughs> it, it happens it happens right it yeah happens. um okay so, and so now you say the priority is boxing and you, Priority is boxing. You, you're doing well, right? You, you, I'm you doing great. I'm in the top. You. I'm in the top quarter in the world for boxing for heavyweights right now. So, okay. Yeah. Now, where does that where does that put you? The top quarter. Uh, I'm yeah, in the you, top. You've been on ESPN national audience, like that's in my mind. That's a that's a huge deal. You know, not not yeah. too many people. Not too many people are gonna uh, have the full attention of the nation on lockdown uh right. you know and, and that had to be a really weird experience man i thought it what, was what, crazy like first just what does it mean to be in the top quarter and then second what was it like going and fighting in a giant arena like that with no fans with nobody <laughs> and you know the the people disinfecting everything every all the time yeah. like that had to be that had to be a really weird experience yeah, so it, me being in the top quarter, I'm in the top 300 out of, I think, 1,700 in the world. Uh, I am in the top 90 now. I used to be in the top 60, but I'm in the top 90 out of 300 in the United States. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle. Still a lot of work to do. A lot of work to do, um, but you also are fairly young in the boxing game. Two years. Yeah. Two years, yeah. Two years so, and, and you, you've already 
made a pretty good name for yourself. You've already kind of uh, shown that you can't be taken lightly. Uh, right. You still have some some polish work to do, though, right? Yes, footwork. Footwork yeah, and boxing, maybe a few pounds. Boxing a little bit different than the uh, the bare knuckle where you say it reminds you of uh, back in the day, just going in there and yeah. slinging skin everywhere. Uh, That's right. Boxing is, yeah. is technique and, and – it's more uh, more brain it's power, a Chess match, you know. Uh, yes. You, you yes. want to where you put your foot matters. Where where your elbows are matters. How how you have your hands matter. How you move your shoulders matters. All that That's right. matters all the time. That's and right. You have yeah. all the power in the world. You know, you 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 can you can KO anybody if you catch them yeah. right. But right. you know, it's the all these little little maneuvers and nuances of the sport that you're still kind of yeah. coming to grips with right that's right yeah, yeah and i don't want i don't want to speak out of turn or anything I'm no that's that's completely right that's everything you said is completely right you know the 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 three losses that i do have are all against olympic medalist winners like they've won medals you know uh so it is a chess match they you know they're thinking three steps ahead they're thinking you know, I'm still at, I'm still at that point where I'm trying to brawl. I'm trying to make it a brawl, and and they're just taking little steps here, little you're steps. You're looking there. for that. You're looking for that one punch, and right. they score three points on you while you're looking for yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. They're all decision losses. They're all decision losses. So. No, there's no doubt. I mean, even in the, the, the this last fight, I could tell there was one or two times. I, I'd say at least two times where I thought you had him. You know, yeah. it, it was like boom, and I was like, uh oh. And then, but the you know the dude's experience. You could just tell he's experienced and he's polished. Yeah. Like it catches in. He knows how to move to where you you land the stun shot, but the follow up he's not there anymore. Like his just natural instinct to get out of the way of that was there. And yeah. and like he was just a more polished boxer. You know, if, That's right. if, you, lock, if you lock you and him in a in a closet with each other and, 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 you know, right. it, it, it ain't going to be good for him, but you put yeah, I'm coming out. Thing with yeah. all the rules and the, the judges and all that stuff, you know, it's a different yeah. story. That's right. That's right. Uh, so where do you, where do you progress from here? Where do I go from here? Yeah. The what, goal... What's the, maybe not what's the next step what or i guess the next step is is the most reasonable question but like where do you uh when you think about your goals in the sport right um uh, like where where do you see what's your goal goal like end goal the end game the, i think the end game for me is uh well first of all you know i want to be remembered man i want to be remembered as man that's a tough ass dude that that dude walks in and and you know you're in for a freaking fight, man. You're going to fight. And it's not going to be a, oh, I knocked him out in the second or third round. It's a, we're going all six, eight, 10, 12 rounds. We're going all, every single round. And we're going to feel each other, you know. And, uh, you know, B is, man, if you're not in it to be a world champion, you shouldn't be in it, period. So I'm definitely in it to be a world champion. Uh, yeah. You're – you're you're the type of guy who looks to help people. You're look, the type of guy who looks to take take up for people. Um, you, you'll put yourself out there to kind of to shield others from misfortune. Um, it's not the prototypical mentality of a fighter. Right. Uh, it's not at least what people think of. Right when right. they and they hear a fighter, a guy dedicated to the the fight game, a boxer, a you know a a, a jock athlete, a punisher of sorts, they don't think of uh, you know a, a big old sweetheart. So at right. what point do you the in your fight preparation when you're when you're in the arena? I, I'm I, I envision this as a process, right? You, you, you go, mm -hmm. you, you get the way in, you do all that stuff. The next day you come back and like every, every step you take towards getting into the ring is like uh, you kind of turn the dial a little bit. And, and, yeah. it, and at some point it, it leaves 
you know, this everyday Juan to it's on, you know, like it's time. T- time to get to work, you know, all got to yes. put all that stuff to the side and it's time to yeah. do what I need to do. You know, at what yeah. point describe to me the process of locking that in and like, at what point does it happen when you're wrapping up your hands, when you're walking out the, the, the tunnel, when you're climbing into the ring or before or after or what? There's different times there. You know, you have that time at the Wayne when you're sitting there eye to eye with the guy you're going to fight. Um, you know, you wrap your hands, and, and Coach already knows, like, man, we wrap his hands, we glove him up. I'm probably not going to work out or warm up much in the back. I'm going to sit there, and I'm going to think, man. And I just think and think and think, and, you know, get, you get in the ring, and, and it's the same thing, man. Like, I look across, and I'm – at this point, man, I understand it's a business now. I understand, you know, we're both there to take care of our families. And – uh you know, it's just, I just, all the bad things that have ever happened to me pile up at that moment. Mm-hmm. All the bad shit that, uh, that I've been through, all the crap that I've been through, man, that's all I can think of. All the people who still believe in me, you know, that is just, I guess it, it, it just, that's, that's my anger. That's, that's my push. You know, the, the people that, that did bad to me for no reason mm-hmm. or, or whatever, you know, those are the people that, I think of those are the people, the good and the bad people. So it's just, you just go through a, a, through a ton of emotions within the, I don't know, 30 seconds before the bell rings. And then you got to clear your mind and you got to, okay, this is, this is the next step. Or, this, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. You can't think about it too much, but that's what goes through my mind. All the people that, that, that don't believe in me, all the people that do believe in me, um, my kids, these kids that, you know, I adopted, you know, just everything everything goes through my mind so let let's hit that for a second you you uh you've adopted two children two kids okay yep. and what what was that process like man it was tedious um so my sister's a she's an addict she's just a straight up addict and i don't you know i love her but i don't care for her no more She's done a lot of messed up things for my family, to my family. And it's one of those things that I had to get those kids out of it because they were in danger of getting raped. They were in danger of, you know, getting drugged or or whatever. It just, it wasn't a good place. And and they weren't going to have any morals. They weren't going to learn anything. They weren't going to be, you know, upstanding citizens if they stayed with her, you know? It was one of those things that I had to, and, and, you know, one thing you learn from the streets is you don't go and tattletale, right? You, you know, you don't, you don't do that. But I was the one that called CPS. I was the one to get that process started because my parents were scared of her. My parents, uh, you know, to their defense, they, she threatened them a lot of, you'll never see your grandchildren again if you even dare try this. And it came to the point where one day, I think she went to Galveston with my niece, who was two at the time. My nephew hadn't even been born. And she's out getting drunk, talking crap to cops and just acting stupid with with a bunch of men and, and, and women. And she ended up, you know, we ended up finding out, you know, she was a prostitute too. You know, like, there's no fucking way in hell that I could sleep every night in peace, wake up, go to work, and be okay with it, knowing that my niece is in that kind of danger. And, and my parents were scared to do anything about it. Mm-hmm. So I called them. I called them. They came. You know, they kicked her out of my parents' house. They told my parents to keep the kids. And I thought that was going to be it. I thought that was it. My parents got this now. You know, she's gone. She'll stay away. No, she doesn't. She just didn't care. It, it was, she didn't care. And, and she'd still threaten them. And she'd say, you know, things like, oh, well, I know people in cartels in Mexico. And we'll come and take the kids. And you'll never see them again. And it came to one point where my mom and my new, my nephew was born already. All in between all this, my nephew was born, and you know, it came to the point where my mom was like, I think she took them out to McDonald's, took the kids out to McDonald's, and uh, my sister calls. She's like, Hey, you know, I got beat up again by this dude. Um, I need a place to stay. Uh, and my parents, they're gonna love their kids no matter what. You know, they're always going to have that heart for them. And I understand that. 
but and, and, and the, I was like that too. I was like that too. I, I I wanted to protect her as much as I could. And I remember the first time she got beat up by a dude, the crap that went through my mind and, and what it took for me to stay home and not go do anything. And well, she she ends up barricading herself in my parents' house. And uh she we called they called the cops. My mom was at McDonald's with the kids. My dad was pleading with her to get out of the house. You know, they could get, my parents would get in trouble for even letting her come to the house. And I just remember getting a call at 11 p.m. from a CPS uh, social worker saying, hey, we're fixing to take the kids uh, because your parents, they, you know, they can't, they can't do what they're asked to do. And uh, I remember going and picking them up and, and, you know, my mom, my mom basically raised them from when they were a day old. You know, so I, of course, she was going to come wherever the kids were going because I can't do it by myself. I can't just become a, you know, a great father overnight or anything like that. So I, I remember that night, man, it was, she cried up until 7 a.m. man, until she finally passed out and went to sleep. I mean, she dehydrated herself with tears, man. That's how bad it hurt, you know, that her own daughter would do that to her. And uh, all you can really say, all I could tell is, we're going to be okay. Don't worry about it. You know, the kids are going to be okay. That's the only thing that matters right now is the kids. These kids, they just started. We as adults already have a choice in life, whether we want to be good, whether we want to be in the neighborhood, whether we want, whatever it is that we want to do, we have the freedom to do that. And if you don't think about these kids, I'll think about them. I'll make those decisions for you, you know? And, uh, it just, and it was, it was just a knockdown drag out battle with her because, She'd call and, and say that this is going on when it wasn't. It, it was just a mess. It was a mess. Um, it took like a year for me to get full custody of the kids. And uh, it was the greatest feeling in the world, man. Just be, knowing that she can't do anything about about it. She can't hurt those kids. She can't She can't take them one day and not come back, you know? It was just it was I mean, great. That, I mean, that speaks a ton to it towards – your character, you know, it takes a lot to stand up to a family member and m most people, probably the majority of people don't have that gumption to them to where they, they'll, they'll challenge a family member, even when that family member's wrong and putting their, their kids and, and other loved ones in danger. Most people will just do their best to kind of smooth things over. Smooth uh, it over. Yeah. Right. It, and it, it takes, a lot of courage, a lot of gumption to to be able to step up and not worry about the waves that you're going to cause to do the right thing. And uh, right. you know, if we, if we had if we had more people out there willing to make a few waves to do the right thing and to protect the people who need to be protected, the, you know, we, we'd be in a whole lot better situation all the way around. And uh, right. that that's that just speaks volumes to. Uh, to your character, man. It goes to, to, it reinforces what I've already said about you being a really nice guy, just a good dude. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's very impressive. And uh, I know the, the, those, those kids are gonna grow up with love and knowing they're uh, protected and knowing their boundaries. And, and there's, there's few things as influential to a child as just knowing that they have love and they have safety. Right. Uh, those two things are, uh, uh, the kids are so uh, flexible. You know, they, they can deal with so much. Uh, right. All they need to know is that somebody loves them and like they're, they're going to be okay. You know, they're going right. to, like somebody's going to take up for them. Somebody loves them enough not to put them in danger. And right. Yeah, ideally that's the parent, that's that's the mom or the dad. But when that fails, to have somebody with the, uh, you know, with the courage and ability and then and the heart to take them in and, you know, uh, absorb them and take that role, man. That's 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 uh that's that's real leadership. That's real. That's real stuff. Uh, don't don't ever let yourself sell yourself short. I know you're humble. I know you're good. I know you 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 
put others in front of you, but like don't ever don't ever lose sight about what a what a chore that is and what a like you know just how impressive that is. Uh, that, that's that's good, and and I know that that's not that's just a that's just one facet of you. You know, that's uh, taking care of your mom, taking care of your of your 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 niece and your nephew and really in the process probably doing what you need to do to your sister you know like that's still some people don't need to be coddled they need that that that, they need that rough love. awakening you know is that they, they need yeah. that that uh to be handled not so gently and uh yeah. you know it, it sounds like you you're just willing to do what you need to do to make sure things are are in as good of a position as what they can be, uh, exactly. and, you know. Kudos to you for that. That that's that's I big time, it, brother. That's big time. Um. So you you run a gym, am I right? I uh I help I help run a gym. My okay. my coach is you're, my you're, my you're camera. With, let's not just let's not just overlook the fact. I don't even think we've mentioned it yet that you're also a full time <laughs> teacher. Yes. Yeah. So I just, I just barely got certified. Um, last year, last year was my first year where I was sort of fully certified as a teacher. And you teach what? I teach, I'm a special ed teacher. Okay. I teach, uh, I'm a behavior support. I teach in the behavior support classroom. So basically you know, all the kiddos that have a hard time in general education, you know, just behavior problems or uh, same thing, like, you know, maybe they had, you know, emotional problems when they were younger or, you know, most of them are younger. They're five, six, seven years old, you know, but Pretty young. that's, yeah, they're babies, man. So, yeah, I've seen a lot or heard of a lot of stories of the kids that I've, you know, run across so far. No. But you know those babies are are where you can influence them the most. They're, That's right. They're uh they're searching for people right. to provide stability to them. Uh, they're right. searching for boundaries. You know that uh, to, kids need to know boundaries. They need they feel comfortable knowing that you know this is this is the line I can't cross it. As long as I'm in here, I'm safe. As long as I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You know uh, what the rules allows allows me to do. They're okay. They're good. They That's feel right. comfortable. They feel confident. They can make good decisions. They don't have to panic. They don't like. And when they get used to that, now they can start making good decisions. You right. Know, they can start right. getting rewarded for these good decisions that they use the rules to their advantage, and they enjoy that process. And uh, it's it's. And when they don't get it at home, they, they got to get it somewhere, you know? So a, a lot of that's people right. will, will say that, well, that's, that's the parent's job. The kid, that's not the school's job. That the school's job is to you know, teach them math, teach them science, teach them English, teach them how to read and write, that type of stuff. Uh, it's, yeah. the, it's the parents, it's the grandparents, it's the home that is responsible for uh, building character and things like that. Uh, but in today's reality is uh, there's, there's many, many, many situations where the the home is just not put together well. Right. There's there's a, a and it's not even necessarily saying that they're bad parenting. It, it could be a single parent who has to work two jobs, who goes to work at six in the morning and doesn't get off until seven or eight at night, and that by the time they get home, they do good to put a, uh, some food out there and put the kid to bed, you know, like, That's right. th and there's just not a lot of opportunity for people in that situation to instill these values that everybody just expects to have. Um, so it's, again, it's good that these kids that are, are vulnerable and have already shown that they're lacking this structure and that this discipline uh, can come in and interact with with uh, people who are just naturally there providing that type of uh, role model. You know, so that's, right. that's good. And you've, you've been doing that for a couple years, right? This is uh, year two? This year will two. be my third, three, third year, third year. 
Okay, good, good. And uh, how, how does that feel to you? How does, would you say that this is uh, your, as far as uh, career outside of, you know, being the, the heavyweight champion of the world, uh, would you say that the career in law enforcement is still in the background or would you say that this is your new focus or, or uh, uh, if it is your new focus, would you say that you are fulfilling that, that desire to help people? As far as uh, career outside of, you know, being the, the heavyweight champion of the world, uh, would you say that the career in law enforcement is still in the background or would you say that this is your new focus or, or uh, uh, if it is your new focus, would you say that you are fulfilling that, that desire to help people? I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, man, I am religious. I am really religious, man. Um, I spent, you know, you, I was a lieutenant at East Ham. That was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I wanted to move up that ladder. Um, and you are also one of the people that helped me that helped me get through the crap that I was going through the years after that. Um, your words, you, you know, you looking out for me, you, you checking on me, you know, and I didn't, I didn't even know you, man. You just reached out to me. Um, but I put my hand, I put myself in, I guess I put myself in God's hands, man. I, I remember just several nights crying and just being like, man, God, just please, this is what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Let me know what I need to do. Where, 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 where am I going? You know? And, he put me in this path. He put me in this path to go and, and, and try to help these kids out, man. This is, and I start, you know, it's crazy. Like it's just everything in my life with all the bad that's happened in my life, everything has always fallen into place. It might not have been the next day or the next week or the next year or the year after that. But every single time that something bad has happened in my life, I can sit there. And once I get to the, to where I'm okay, to my to my winning season, I guess you can call it. I sit there and I and I can reflect and be like, "Wow, God, this is where you wanted me. This is what you wanted me to do." It's, and I firmly, when you're in the moment, it feels so wrong. It hurts, it man. So it hurts. Up. You feel you feel betrayed and abused and and left hurt and kind of adrift. You know, like yeah, what the hell? Um, yeah. You know, I, I did everything you wanted me to do, and for it, like I got you get you get ran out and treated uh, treated like trash and like an outsider. And, yeah, yeah and, and all of a sudden you're there. You know, nobody wants to come stand next to you when you're when nobody you're answering would. questions. Nobody wants to, you know. Uh, uh, no, I, I can't tell you how many times every step of my process and I, I don't know how it went with with yours exactly but with my process you know i filed grievances and i i i, I was talking to uh you know the, the the warden at the unit i was on and then i talked to the regional director and then i, I and then i talked to a, a, a deputy director and every step of the way they they looked at everything and they read the reports and they looked at, you know, the evidence they were given and they were like, man, this just doesn't seem right. Uh, this, this seems real suspect. Uh, yeah. And I, I'd say, well, yeah, it is. I mean, not, none of this is, could, could you please call that guy and ask him <laughs> if what they're saying yeah. is, is accurate? Uh, can you look at the videotape? Because the videotape would show that this guy wasn't even in the area. It shows yeah. him, way in some different part uh and every step of the way no we can't do that we can't do that yeah. it's out of our hands that's what they said all the time this looks bad man i don't i don't know how they're doing this but it's out of my hands nobody was willing to say this is clearly wrong like they they would say this is clearly wrong but nobody would follow that up with 
would do anything about it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna let this happen. Now, right. and these were people that I worked with for over a decade. These were people yeah. who, uh, who would send me on special little tasks, you know, and give me special right. little assignments and and do do all this stuff over the years, you know, and and right. then the the one time I I literally needed them. Uh, Sorry, man. Can't do nothing um, about it. It just, it was so eye-opening and it let me, it let me know how vulnerable I was. You know, I always walked around, I always felt, I always felt like I was in control of stuff. I always uh, felt like I had a, a good grasp on things. I could deal with it. Right. I, felt like I was, I, I could pretty much outthink my way out of most situations. And if that didn't work, I was pretty proficient in a scrap. You know, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, uh, I, I never felt that vulnerable. You know, there were, right. there were situations where I knew I was in trouble. Uh, right. There were situations where I knew I couldn't fight my way out of it and be unscathed. And I was just hoping somebody else would show up, but would step up. Yeah. But you know, I yeah. never felt, helpless and vulnerable until I got into that situation, you know, situation. And, then, and when I got, when I got word that you were going through a similar situation without knowing any of the details or anything like that, I just kind of felt like it was similar. You were probably feeling similar things to what I felt. And yeah. uh, from, from everything I heard about you, like a, a good dude. And you know what, let me, uh, if, I would have appreciated somebody reaching out to me and if nothing else, being able to talk to them in a way where we're, we're relatable, you know, like right. being able to, to kind of share the same story and like go through the same playbook and maybe this will work for you. It didn't work for me or this worked for me. You know, an exchange right. of information felt so uh, right. And, uh, but going through that, also let me know how unprepared I was for it. Uh, man, I got, I got cast out 16 years, showed up for a staff meeting and was fired for something that happened two years ago that nothing was ever wrong with. Yeah. Um, confused, hurt, unprepared, not having a clue what I'm about to do next. You know, I got, I got yeah. bills and a kid and, like this is uh this it hits you fast. It hits yeah, you fast. just feeling lost, you know, and it's yeah. like yeah, you know, so my goal moving forward was to whatever it is I get into, never allow myself to feel that vulnerable again. Uh exactly. And you know, I, I decided that education was the path to take. And uh I found a, a little job that was gonna pay me some steady income and not stress me out too much and, and focused up on my school, knocked out the bachelor's degree, uh, kind of looked at what may or may not open up for me from that point and decided that it would be in my best interest to go ahead and continue school. Now I'm in law school and hopefully when I'm done with law school, uh, I can open up my own doors. You know, I can, I can, right. I can be in control of my own uh, destiny my efforts will reflect my success and my success right. will be a reflection of my efforts and uh, I, I won't have to depend on on others I won't have to I won't have to put in that work for other people who can then cast me away when it's convenient for them you know for them that's uh, right yeah yeah no but I just feel like through everything that happened man it just God put me where I needed to be period that's I'm where I need to be. I'm where I'm helping. And at the end of it all, you look around and you're like, man, this actually feels kind of right. You know? It's great. Yeah. I it's actually great. feel you know like what? I'm more where I'm supposed to be now than where I was so angry about getting kicked out of before, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It just, and then you, you lose yourself in that place, man. You lose yourself. You lose, you end up losing your morals. You end up thinking, it's just, it's just not a good place to be at, man. Well, you know, you, you hear people talk about the person you are and the person that you're becoming. And uh, oh, I can't remember exactly. I think maybe Joel Olstein, who I'm not a huge fan of, but I think it's something that he, he, he would say is like, if you want to, 
if you want to know what kind of person you are, look, look around the people you hang around, like look around the people you're around the most. And when you're around convicted felons the most, you know, I, I felt closer with a lot of those convicts than I did a lot of the officers or even people who I communicate without. Not so much that we were like on the same page or buddy, buddy or something. But right. if you see somebody every day for 15 years, uh, yep. you know, you, you just develop a, a sense of comfort with them. Like, hey, man, right. you know, you're good. All right. There you go. Oh, yeah. You, know, you, you, you end up knowing their, uh, knowing their, their kids and their parents and their wife and stuff through visitation. And, and like, right. it's not even that you're trying to or that, you know, it just you, happens. Yeah, you, you, and happens. you would never like call them your friend or even talk to them right. the same way you would talk to a friend, but there's just right. some sort of little connection that is formed, you know? And right. Right. these are the people that you're spending most of your time with. Your time with. Right. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that we take something away from everybody that we meet and everybody that we hang around, you know? Uh, yeah. You might tell That's a funny complete. joke or say, do something in, in some kind of way that I think is is – charming or witty or something and i you know I'm, i might i might steal that you know i might run, take that with me and or whatever we, we i just feel like we absorb a little bit of everybody we come into contact with and man, we, right. we have been in the constant in contact with so many people that you really don't want to absorb anything from but it, it right. gets in you, you know it gets in you and and it, it takes a toll and after years and years and years you're callous and you're kind of uh you're not the same person that you were when you went in and you're probably right. not the person you really want to be. And, right. uh, you know, I'm, I'm several years removed from everything. And I can tell you that th- there's, there's still a lot of uh, griminess in me left over from. Oh yeah. You uh, never lose some of that stuff. You uh, never lose and, it. Uh, but you know, that, that's, that's our journey, man. That's, that's just that's the way, great. that's the path we had to go through to get to where we're going. And uh, we're going to put that in the, we're going to put all those lessons we learned in the toolbox. Uh, we're going to carry that with us. And at some point in time, we're going to need all that to succeed in what we're doing next. That's right. That's now, true. We learned That's how to true. talk to people. I can have a conversation with people who have uh, PhDs, MDs, or, or just straight, felonies. yeah, straight felonies, straight <laughs> yeah. villains, you know, like I can, yeah. Uh, yeah. I can I can be on multiple levels, and I think that's something yeah. that really helped me when I go to to venture into uh, you know being a being a practicing lawyer. So yeah, and, and that's also something that's going to help you when you're dealing with troubled kids. Right, that's right. And you know, even even to this point, like most of my friends are felons. I sit back and I'm like, man, most of my friends are felons. My co- both my coaches are felons, man, and they're two of the greatest people in the world, man. I would, I'd take a bullet for both of them, man. They're both great, amazing people. And it's like, yeah, I don't think, I I just, think I don't, the system has failed people very drastically in, in the way that, that they have to carry that label with them. Um, right. In some situations, you know, they, they, they need to, to die with it and be miserable forever. You know, we're talking about pedophile, uh, right. uh, rapists, things like that. I got, Got yeah. no sympathy for any of them. They, they, they right. need, uh, my opinion, somebody who's worked in the prison for a long time and, and seen some things. And I think the prison should be a much, much harder place. And I think it should be much less populated. Uh, right. I think it should be reserved for those criminals that are complete trash people, you know, the, the, uh, yep. Yeah. There, there's no no reason why a, a a young kid who had too much weed should be in a real prison. Uh, right. There's it just doesn't make any sense, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it be reserved for the, the the baddest of the bad, and then mm-hmm. uh, there should be more rehabilitation and and systems in place to deal with the other stuff. But yeah. uh, you know that's yeah. That's that. Um, so, uh, what are we what are we looking at, man? We've been at it for an hour. How 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 are you looking? 
I'm you, good, brother. I'm good. Unless you need to throw down or, or are we, we good to keep rolling? Yeah, we can keep rolling, brother. I'm good. All right. I'm good, man. Um, so it, when you're in the gym, you have uh, – you work a lot with, with kids, right, in the gym? Most of the kids that I bring in there are my students. Most of the kids – that I bring in there or that Mike brings in there, even, you know, Mike, you know, he'll bring kids off the street, man. And he's, he's, like I said, he's, he's an OG in the, in the, in the hood over here. Like everybody knows this man. Everybody knows him. Everybody respects him. Everybody respects his grind, man. Like he, he is one of the hardest workers I've ever met. You know, he, uh, man, that dude right there, you know, He's he's another reason why I'm able to do what I what I'm doing for some of these kids. And he's helping you out in the gym. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I help. The gym's in Huntsville, right? Yeah, it's in Huntsville, and uh, right across from the Walls Unit. So, okay. You know, uh, without him, man, I wouldn't be able to help these kids. I really wouldn't, man. He he lets me open the door to these kids, and he opens the door to you know some of the kids that he sees out there, or some of the kids that you know don't have that fatherly figure. He's been a fatherly figure for plenty of kids, you know? Mm -hmm. Takes money out of his own pocket and gives it to them whenever they don't have food, whenever they need something, you know? So how, so, how do you feel the, the sport teaching these kids the, the, the sport, the, whether it's boxing, uh, MMA, what, whatever the case may be, what lessons are they learning that they take with them? I, I think the biggest thing is just pushing through adversity, pushing through adversity, man. You're in there for, for three minute rounds and, and you're tired and you can't lift your arms anymore. It's just pushing those last few seconds or pushing that last minute. You know, it's a, you know, it's just, you just, just pushing through adversity. That's the biggest thing. Fighting adversity, you know, getting that self-confidence about yourself, uh, that discipline, you know? You know, I feel like that's a, uh, that's a big lesson that, that I take from working out. Um, you know, I, I, I'll go in there and I'm, I, I set goals for myself and I try to grind away. And, and I think, the process of going through and, and feeling, feeling the failure, right? right. And knowing where your boundaries are. And sometimes that, that, that really puts you in your place. You know, sometimes so it's, I, man, I really thought I was better off than what I am. And I just right. kind of got humbled real quick. But right. so I read, I read a, uh, I, I read a, uh, uh, a quote today. Earlier today, it was this morning, I think. It said, "Right when you're tired, like right when you're tired and you feel like you can't go anymore, that's you. That's your brain telling you you're only at forty percent. You have sixty percent more to go, and you know most people don't understand that you're only at forty percent." Oh, man, I firmly believe that. I thought, yeah. Uh, well, there's no doubt because I what I've become comfortable with is there's that first wave of tired that hits, you know, and right. it's like, man, whether, whether we're talking about, uh, in the gym, I haven't been, uh, I haven't been out to, to roll or bang or anything in quite some time. I probably need yeah. to do that, but I, 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 I'll have to come humiliate myself, uh, over there at the gym one day. Come on, brother. When you yeah. want, man, you know, that the doors are open for you. But, uh, you know, that rather we're talking about rolling, uh, boxing they're talking about lifting weights or running on a treadmill or whatever like i just expect for there to be a wave of kind of exhaustion that comes over me at some at some point kind of fairly early on in the process and yeah. and and there's a voice in your head at that point where it's like all right man that's enough you know, you, you you've done enough today uh yeah you know, and, and you think of things that are comfortable that you could be doing. You know, ah, I could go get in that air condition. You know, I could tell, yeah. I could take a shower, lay down. I bet there's a movie on Netflix I could watch. There's, there's yeah. something that doesn't hurt that I could be doing, you know? Right, uh, right. And, and you got to just push through that uh, yeah. because comfort is a trap. Uh, and 
if you're constantly chasing being comfortable, then you're not making progress on anything. Nope. And that's nope. just a, that's a lesson that I take from working out. And it's a good reminder for me every time I go to the gym that like, you know, if I'm, if I'm trying to be comfortable, then I'm not getting any stronger. I'm not getting any bigger. I'm not getting any better. Right. And, and then mm. I take that and apply it to my studies. If I'm, if I'm feeling comfortable, uh, if, if I'm, comfortable if i'm not stressed a little bit about my studies if i'm not pushing myself if i'm not tired uh and and still studying and still grinding away then then i'm not doing everything i need to do to get better you know yeah. and and those that's just a simple little lesson that can be applied to almost anything you get into right right that's uh, it man it's that's true you know struggle yeah. is natural comforts the enemy, uh, work hard. When you, when you feel like you need to quit, that means you need to, you need to. That's when you push yourself, more. Yeah. That, that this is not the goal, you know, right. uh, you're not going to reach any goal. If you quit every time your, your mind kicks in and says, ah, this isn't comfortable. You know, got, got to, got to keep on grinding. That's a, that's a big lesson for kids. And, and if you're you successful know. in teaching them, that then that's something that they'll carry forever and ever man that's yeah, those those you know those 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 values man those the, the the morals just you know just the self-esteem i have a kid who first day just low self-esteem holding his head down and you know i understand you know there's there's things that you can't help you can't help buying yourself some brand new shoes you can't help making sure you're always fly you're always wearing the nicest clothes and for a young kid, man, that's everything. You know, the kids are vicious at, at, at you know, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, man. You know, they don't they don't understand the stuff that people are, go through, you know, and, and, you know, just self-esteem, helping helping the kids get in there and, and, and push. And I remember the first day I had him do, I don't know, 10 push-ups. And he's like, I can't do push-ups. I can't do push-ups. Well, here, let's do them together. We'll get it done. I don't care if you're on your knees, whatever. The next, or two weeks later, same thing. We're done with our workout. You had a great bag workout. You did you, you did so great with these bag rounds compared to the first time you did the bag rounds. You know, let's finish up the workout. Let's do these 10 pushups. Okay, I get my 10 pushups done and he's still pushing. I walk away, come back and he's still pushing. Uh, he gets up, he's like, I did 50. I said, man, that's freaking awesome. You know, that's freaking awesome. Oh, uh, what? Why? Why'd you do fifty? Oh, because ten was easy, and I wanted to push myself. Man, that's freaking awesome. I am proud of you, man. That keep going, and you know, you just you want to congratulate them on those little, those little, you know, rec personal records. You know, hey, man. You know, strength. he he defeated himself there. He he. That's right. You know, in that case, he was his own barrier. And he was able to overcome that just by effort. And once he found out he could, once he found out that was his own little barrier, he was like, man, yeah. let's see, let's see what I got. I, I well, clearly, I have more than what I thought. Let's see what it is. That's right. That's, that's right, man. Uh, he'll, yeah. he'll walk around and hold his head up high. Uh, that's that's little, right. And he'll go brag about that to somebody, you know? Yeah. yeah. Me and my administration, man, we're all, we're all excited to see what he's going to do. This year. It's going to be a good year for him and, and like I said, man, it's just his whole self-esteem now, just watching him now compared to when I first met him, compared to the stories I heard. But man, this kid, he's going to be great. He's mm. going to be great. Yeah, that man, that's, that's something. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, stories like that, I, I really like. I, I have a soft spot for the kiddos and, uh, you know, I've, I've coached little baseball teams and basketball teams and, and yeah. stuff like that. And I'm, uh, I'm not really, uh, as far as the sport goes, uh, I'm probably not who you are rooting for to have your kid, uh, coached or, or learn baseball from, uh, <laughs> right. was, was never just being ball. out there and putting that effort. Just yeah, it, you know, it, it, I, I'm not the uh, the technically sound person when it comes to baseball or basketball, but I'm 
I really enjoy interacting with the kids and making sure that they have a good time and that, that they take a little something from it and they, they feel like they've participated and that they feel like they were an actual member of the team. Okay. You know, like right. it, it's my experience that everybody does something good. Right. Um, you know, and in order to win a team sport, you have to, you have to have somebody good at all this stuff. You know, we, we don't right. just need a bunch of people who can shoot three pointers. Like you need somebody who can grind out rebounds or, and we need somebody who can really play defense down low or, and we need, we need somebody who can throw the ball in really good, you know? Mm -hmm. And if, if you work hard enough, you can find something that each one of these kids do that's pretty good. And if you just let them go out there and be pretty good at this one thing, they feel like they've contributed and they, they, they take that with them. And now all of a sudden they're willing to try these other things that, that they weren't that great at, but they'll do it with more confidence. And, and eventually right. all of a sudden, you know, that they're, they're now all of a sudden they're making their layups or they're, they're going in there and they're hustling for a rebound or they're, they're running right. trying to get a double instead of uh, limping out of uh, a single. So the little things, you know, but little you things. see the increase and you can see, you can see where a lot of the kids are just starving for attention of uh, a male. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. Um, that they, they don't have that father figure at home. And when they come here and, and or that they come to uh, the come to practice and you can just tell that they're just aching to have that, that male figure. That coach. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Look, Oh, coach. Hey man, today at school, I did this. this exactly I got right. this great. Yeah. I did that. And like, you know, there's, I, I grew up when I went to go play sports, I wasn't trying to talk about grades. I wasn't trying to talk about right. it. Anyway, I'm just trying to play sport. But, you know, those, yeah. the, the, you can tell that the kids that really just look forward to having that interaction with a, 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 a you know, a, a male figure, like they, they're trying to dump all this information on you at once, you know, and they want to have yeah. this interaction and, 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 you know, they want to, they want to talk to you about just random stuff and, and dig yeah. in your head a little bit. And they, they love that you interact with them because they don't get that all the time. And exactly. if I'm being honest, like, man, that, that, it kind of just breaks my heart, you know, like yeah. I, I see it and I'll go, I, I make sure that I give them a little extra attention. I'll make attention. sure you say, hey, man, let's say uh, you, you want to let, let's come over here and work on that. The, those free throws. Let's just, work on passes until your mom shows up or something, you know, and like yeah, just yeah. spending a little extra time with those kids that you can tell need it. I think that goes a long way. Um, at least I hope remember that. maybe even if it doesn't go a long way, it at least it gets them through to the next time, you know, and, and yeah, uh, sometimes yeah. that's all we can hope for. And it, it, it sounds like that's, it sounds like that's something that you're really good at. It sounds like, that's right in your wheelhouse is to, to, you know, interact with these kids that need that type of, uh, need that type of nurturing and seems like you're really good at, at providing that to them. And, and there's really not too many things else that you can do in life as far as being remembered, which is what you told me the big goal was, uh, you know, yeah. um, yeah. When it comes to being remembered, when we're old and decrepit and beat up because we've acted a fool for too long and uh, can't hardly walk around, there's going to, you know, there's going to be little, what are little kids right now? There's going to be grown adults and somebody that, that I am the way I am because Coach Torres showed me that, that 10 push-ups wasn't nothing. You know, that right. he, he showed me that I can do I can do way more than I think I can. And that's a big deal, if, man. Don't, don't underestimate. If I can make a difference. Yeah, yeah. don't underestimate. If I can make a, a difference in one kid's life, man, just, you know, one, hopefully all of them, but, man, if I could make a difference in one kid's life, man, I think I've achieved yeah, something. And I think you've knocked that out of the park. I think you're going to – you're, you're uh, you may very well end up being a heavyweight champ. You may very well end up being a top contender. You may be on a big pay-per-view bout someday and, and, you know, 
grind it out and don't ever stop until you feel satisfied. Uh, but I, I, no matter where you stop in the fight game, no matter what you find your ceiling to be, whether it's all the way at the top or when something happens and you can't, you know, hit, hit another ring again, like the, the way you approach life and the way you approach these kids and the way you uh, are willing to, um, the way you're willing to get knocked off your path and then stabilize, readjust, refocus, and, and tackle what's in front of you with, with the energy and the passion that, that you show, man, that's, that's priceless. And that's, what's going to get it done. You know, whatever, whatever version of success it is you have for yourself, like that, that mentality and that effort and that energy, that's, what's going to get you there. It's not, you know, you, it's not going to be how, how fast you can throw those hands. It's going to be, it's going to be what's in that head and it's going to be what's in that heart. And you're, you're, man, you're killing it. You're killing it. I appreciate that, brother, man. I appreciate that. No doubt. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to keep you too much longer, man. What I do, I mentioned success just a second ago. What, uh -huh. what is your overall version of success? Like people have different versions of success. You know, if you ask somebody, uh, what, what it means to be successful there, they could tell you a whole variety of things, uh, you know, from, from, uh, money to cars, to trophies, to, to kids, to whatever the case may be. Right. But when you say you want to be successful, cause we all want to be successful, you know, right. What, what does that mean to you? I think first of all, first and foremost, it's making sure those kids freaking live the best life they can live. Mm -hmm. My niece and nephew, make sure that they can live the best life they can live. Uh, secondly, man, I think it'd be just making my mom proud, you know? I'm still mm -hmm. a mama's boy. I'm still yep. a mama's boy. I yeah, want to make good. her proud, man. Get up. Um, uh, the money's nice. You know, the money's nice. The fame is nice. All that stuff is nice and, and it's needed, right? Mm -hmm. I, trust me, I've, I, I've been there I've been there where, where, where you need the money. So it's definitely needed no. to do anything in life, whether it's, you know, help out with, with other people, whatever it is. So, you know, the, the money's needed. But like I said, if I can make a difference in one kid's life, if I could sit here, I don't know, 15, 16, 17 years from now, and one of these students that, you know, I started off with, grow old and, 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 and they go to college and they graduate or, or start whatever careers they want to start, man, that's, that's success to me. That's success. You know, having, having that, that, that family or, 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 or getting, getting married and, 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 and doing all that, that's success to me, man. Just being happy, being happy, having, you know, good vibes, just, you know, and, and like I said, there's not very many people that I tell that I love and, and, and that I consider friends or family or anything like that. So those that I do, they know I do, man. Cause I'll tell them I love them. I mm -hmm. sit there and I'll tell them my coach, man. My coach literally pushed me to get out of retirement because at one point between MMA and boxing, I was like, man, I'm done. I'm a failure at this. There's no point in continuing. And this freaking dude, he texts me every freaking morning at, I'd say, 6 or 7 p.m. or a.m., I'm sorry, talking about when are you coming back to the gym? You know you can be a, a heavyweight champ one day. You know you gotta you gotta get up here, man. You gotta get up here. I believe in you. You know him and then Ernest, my my other coach. You know just constantly talking trash to me, but at the <laughs> same time letting me know that he loves me. Mm -hmm. Letting me know that I I can be a champion. I can be in the in, in, in the top ten, fifteen, twenty in the world with these heavyweights. You know because I have the heart. I have the stuff that that. That most heavyweights don't have that you're that, that you're born with. All the other stuff, you can you can get that. You know, the, the heart and the chin and all that. I've got that. And he constantly, constantly telling me, you can do this. That's success to me. Proving them right. Proving proving the people that believe in me right and smiling in the in the face of the people that, that doubted me or that, that hate me for no reason or or, or that just want to see me fail just because they want to see me fail. Mm -hmm. Because you know. For the most part, I haven't. I'm not perfect. I am not perfect by any means, you know. But 
I try my hardest. I try my damnedest not to do wrong by anybody. Mm-hmm. So if you don't like me, if 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 you hate me, or if, or if I'm not the the right person for you, it's a you problem. Like I didn't do shit to you. So I'm I'm a just I'm. My mom taught me a long time ago. You smile in those people's face because that hurts them more than anything else. Mm-hmm. That's why, if you, I know you've been to plenty of my fights, so you see you've seen it plenty. I'll sit there and I'll smile and I'll laugh and I'll giggle and this is fun and and because that's what my mom taught me. My mom taught me right when they want to see you fall, right when they want to see you fail, you're still smiling and they hate it. They hate it. So that's that's uh, why uh, I do uh, it. Uh, one of the coolest little things I've seen you do in a fight was in your in one of your Bellator fights where you uh you, you man you asked the dude for uh, you told him you were going to get his t-shirt yeah, uh, in, yeah. in between rounds <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like the bell rang and you're separating and you just got done punching each other in the face and you're like hey man, I'm gonna get that t-shirt after uh yeah yeah we're gonna do that so, <laughs> you know so he's, he's another person I looked I looked I looked up to him man like He's over there in in Africa fighting for for uh, for whatever that you know they have. I don't think they have water over there, so he he has this thing where he's fighting for water for these guys, and that's awesome, and that's cool, and I, and and I look up to him for that. So I definitely want to support. I'm always going to support. You will never see me if it's for something good. You'll never see me not support somebody for it. But there's people here that need help too, like these kids, Absolutely. and 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 you know so. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, that's success people. to me. That that's good. That's good. I'm uh I got one of the uh, benefits of being in law schools. I'm I'm around a lot of people who have a lot of really good ideas, and and that they, they have kind of they're 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 like minded in that they want to help people, right? And uh, right. Uh, I might have I might make uh connect a few dots and see if we can all get on the same page. And as far as uh, getting some getting something happening to where we can uh, do some, some good stuff for some of the kiddos in different communities and stuff. Man, that would be awesome. I think that would it, awesome. probably uh, where there's a will, there's a way and, and man, we're, there's definitely a need. So we can, we can, uh, we can put a few heads together and see what kind of good ideas we can come up with and maybe get something, right. something rolling, man. That's right. Because, because at the end of the day, these kids didn't choose to be here. Yeah. They didn't choose to be in whatever positions they might be in, and if there's some people out there that are willing to help, shit. Absolutely, I'm, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, uh, you know, uh, adults dig their own ditches. You know, right. They, they, we make our we make our decisions, and we right. we we make our beds, and you know, sometimes you make a really nice one, and and it, and, it, and it's very very comfortable and good for right. you, and other times. You know, you you got trash because yeah. that you've made horrible decisions uh, yeah. that have led to a really bad place for you. Um, right. I really don't care. Like that's totally fine. You go. Yeah. You go have your trash existence because that's what you've earned. But right. man, when you start introducing kids into that, I I have so much sympathy for the kids because they've done nothing not one nothing. decision that this kid made put him in that trash situation you know it's like those kids are worried about transformers and spider-man that's one thing that I, that i've learned man transformers spider-man and you know all that other stuff they, they, they don't see all that crap that some of them are going through or they don't even know they're in the middle of of a fire you know and it's oh, like man. well that's just their world that's just that's just home or you know, whatever version, you know, whatever they call it, that's just the world they're in. And you, if that's all you know, you don't know how bad it is, you know? Right. And, and it's like they, they can still have good attitudes and be pretty, you know, happy, but they're also because they don't know any better. And then as they, right. as they grow up in it, it becomes more and more apparent that they, there's problems and there's issues and these issues then start to really have a massive effect. And uh, exactly. it, it's not the kid's fault at all. Um, not at all. We can, man, if it, anything that can be done to help lessen the burden on those little guys, I'm, I'm, I'm for. Uh, awesome, brother. Yeah, well, I'll, 
I'll see if, you know, you put, you put your uh, head together or you know, find, find some people over on your end. I'll, I'll hustle up some people on my end. We'll see if we can come up with some sort of uh, wild, legal, scholarly, uh, brutal fight game, uh, combat, sport, charity, event, something or other. Yeah. <laughs> Things we'll happen. Get going, man. We'll we'll get, get, we'll get worlds going. collide. Yeah. Come on. There you go. That's right. Yeah. Well, hey, man, I really appreciate you spending some time with me. I mean, we've been at it for an hour and a half or so, and uh, I know you're a busy guy and got a lot going on. Really, really appreciate you uh, sitting down and hashing out and reliving some things and uh, walking us through the process and letting us inside your head, man. I appreciate it too, brother, man, anytime. All right, man, I, we'll, we'll, we'll stay in touch, and we'll have to do this yes, again sir. sometime. Damn right. Have a good night, brother. All right, man, be good. You too.